Good evening. Tonight we will be taking a one-week break from Micah, having moving this week. I have to actually move tomorrow. We have the movers coming, and so we were finishing up packing. I thought it would be good to take a break, and I actually have a biographical study uh, for us tonight on the life of William Tyndale. Uh, we just had Reformation Sunday on this past Lord's Day, so I thought it would be pertinent as well to study the life of the great English reformer, William Tyndale. I used to do this uh, quite often at Agros Reform Baptist Church back when we were pastoring, or I was pastoring there. Uh, we would do biographical studies from time to time, so I hope it is a blessing to you. For those of you who are here who have already heard this, uh, I hope it is a blessing again. I did want to begin by reading from God's Word, however, so in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. We read this. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. I think one of the best things to do when we dive into historical figures from the past and the church is to look at their faith, how we can follow them how we can learn from them, not just those that are immediately over us in the church, but also from church history. We can grow immensely from studying their lives and learning even from their mistakes. Without further ado, in preparing for this uh, paper, this biographical study, I owe much to the following works, which I made ready use of. I drew heavily from an introductory essay by Reverend Henry Walter, an introductory essay by Reverend Henry Walter on the life of Tyndale. This is in volume one of William Tyndale's collected works, which is in two volumes from Banner of Truth, as well as R. DeMoss and Richard Lovett's biography, Stephen J. Lawson's essay on Tyndale titled The Prince of Translators, as well as lectures by Dr. Tom Nettles, Dr. Michael Haken, and Dr. John Piper. So why study William Tyndale? Well, I think there's a lot of good reasons to study the life of William Tyndale. Uh, He is the one who gave us the English Bible that we hold in our hands today. If we did not have William Tyndale and what God did through William Tyndale, we would not have an English Bible, and I think that is something we should rejoice over. One of the hallmarks of the Reformation, as we know so well, was the liberation of the Bible from the papacy, which kept it locked away in the Latin translations from a largely illiterate and uneducated laity. A major work of the Reformation was the Bible's translation out of the original Greek and Hebrew languages into the common languages of the common people. The common language Bibles read by God's people today in English, French, German, Italian, Dutch, Spanish, and a myriad of others come flowing down to us upon a sea of blood. The ability to read God's word in our own language came at the cost of many lives and much suffering, and we shouldn't forget it. The man whom God raised up and used to liberate the Bible and give it to the English-speaking people was the English reformer William Tyndale who purchased its translation from Greek and Hebrew into English with his very blood. More than a century before William Tyndale, a man named John Wycliffe had attempted to relieve the darkness, the darkness that is that the people did not have access to the light of God's word, by translating the Bible into English from the Latin Vulgate, so the Latin Bible of the Church of Rome and then distributed those copies by his followers who came to be known as Lollards. But the church brutally suppressed all of Wycliffe's efforts. Only a few hand-copied Wycliffe Bibles were available in the time of William Tyndale, and it could be fatal to possess even one of them. In 1401, Parliament, English Parliament, passed the De Heretico Cumberendo, the Burning of Heretics Law, which was which made it a crime to own, to produce, or to even read an English translation of the Bible. And it stipulated that those who did so would be burned at the stake. In 1408, Thomas Arundel, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote the Constitutions of Oxford. And in this document, we have written that the forbidding of any translation of the Bible into English unless authorized by the bishops. Arundel wrote the following, quote, It is a dangerous thing 
to translate the text of the Holy Scripture out of one tongue into another. For in the translation, the same sense is not always easily kept. We therefore decree and ordain that no man hereafter, by his own authority, translate any text of the Scripture into English or any other tongue. No man can read any such book in part or in whole, end quote. Which is kind of ironic because the translation that, that he would be talking about here is the Latin, which is uh, made from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. So that one's okay, just no others. Because he can read it. It was within this context that William Tyndale is raised up to translate the Bible. Our next section is the early life of Tyndale. What well, little is known about Tyndale's early life, including the exact place or year of his birth. We do know that he was one of five sons of Thomas and Alicia Tyndale. William was the second of these five sons. The probability is that he was born at Gloucestershire in rural western England, close to the Welsh border in the year, 19, or the year 1493 or 1494, either of those by Tyndale scholars is readily accepted. The majority of what we know of Tyndale's entire life, from his infancy to his death at 46 years old in 1536, comes from the great Reformation historian named John Fox. You may have heard of John Fox or seen his book at Barnes & Noble or other places. He's the author of the famous Fox's Book of martyrs, which in the Church of England early on, especially after the publication of the King James Bible, used to be chained. Every church had chained to it a King James Bible or a Bishop's Bible, and then also an edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. So most of what we know from Tyndale's life comes to us from John Fox's work. The Tyndales were successful and important members of society and had the means of sending their son William to receive an education. In 1506, when he was just 12 years old, William was sent to study at Magdalen School, Oxford. Tyndale would spend the next 10 years of his life studying at Oxford. After two years at Magdalen Preparatory School, he went on to study at Magdalen College in Oxford, where he excelled in his studies of grammar, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music, rhetoric, logic, and philosophy. More importantly, though, especially for our purposes this evening, he made exceptional progress in his study of languages, especially Latin and Greek, under England's finest classical scholars of the time. He earned a bachelor's degree in 1512 and a master's degree in 1515. Now, before leaving Oxford, Tyndale was ordained into the priesthood, though he never entered into monastic orders. A brief note I think is good to have at this point regarding God's providence and raising up Tyndale as a Bible translator. He didn't just raise up anybody but William Tyndale. During his time at Oxford, Tyndale was not only well accomplished as a student in philosophy, but was also an accomplished linguist. Everyone was studied in Latin at that time and also Greek, a smattering of Greek at least, but he went above and beyond. He knew his own mother tongue, English, to a degree that probably few will ever surpass. He had the ability to coin new words and, understand, and understood the rhythm, the rhyme, and the cadence of English so well that he would be used of God to raise English, which at this time was known and thought of as a vulgar, barbaric, and vile tongue. The people of, of England, those royal powers and other people that were more prestigious in society, preferred to use, either use Latin or French because English was thought of as so barbaric. Well, God used somebody like William Tyndale, who so understood English's rhythm and cadence and beauty, to raise English into a language that is now known for its poetic beauty. However, Tyndale was not simply an expert in English. He was an expert linguist in the true sense of the word, understanding exactly how language itself worked. He was fluent not only in Latin and Greek, but also in Spanish, Italian, French, German, and Dutch, and was well acquainted with many other languages. And it was said of him that whichever language he might be speaking or writing, you would think it to be his native language. He's what Pastor Joel and myself uh, really wish we were with a whole lot of languages as well. 
If God were to raise up a man to translate the Greek New Testament into English, this is what that kind of man would look like. He would look like William Tyndale. It was only during the later stages of his time of his time at Oxford that Tyndale was allowed to study theology, though. However, it was useless, speculative theology. He later expressed his disappointment in being shielded from the Bible during his study of theology. He writes, quote, In the universities they have ordained that no man shall look on the Scripture until he be nozzled, that means nursed, in heathen learning eight or nine years and armed with false principles with which he is clean shut out of the understanding of the Scripture. The Scripture is locked up with false expositions and with false principles of natural philosophy, end quote. So after eight or nine years of learning rhetoric and logic and all these other pagan methodologies and scholasticism, then, then after eight or nine years of this, then maybe you could come to the scriptures. By then, you already had such a framework of false expositions, he says, and false principles of natural philosophy that you couldn't even understand the scriptures at that point. Nonetheless, at some point during his later years at Oxford, Tyndale began to come to some realization of the truths of the gospel. John Fox writes that while Tyndale was at Oxford, quote, he read privily or privately to certain students and fellows of Magdalen College some parcel of divinity, instructing them in the knowledge and truth of the scriptures. So once he finally did get a chance to read the scriptures, he began to engage with what he was being taught, probably from the sentences and other uh, works of divinity, of theology that were being given at that time, and basically started interacting and teaching his fellow students. After earning his Master of Arts degree at Oxford, he went to Cambridge, most likely to study under the Dutch humanist and Roman Catholic priest Desiderius Erasmus, who was lecturing in Greek at Cambridge at that time. Now, Erasmus is a name that we all must be very familiar with, Desiderius Erasmus. Why? This Catholic priest was pivotal a pivotal character in the story of the Reformation. It was Erasmus who, in 1516, gave to the world the first ever printed and published Greek New Testament. Although this was certainly not Erasmus's intention, he's a Roman Catholic priest in good standing with the Roman Catholic Church, this was not his intention. Had this Greek New Testament never been printed, it's safe to say that there would not have been a Reformation. Erasmus was also an accomplished linguist, also an accomplished scholar, who had studied Greek grammar, manuscripts, and literature under some of the greatest Greek scholars of the time. And these scholars he had met in Italy and other places, they had fled from Constantinople during the Muslim invasion. They'd be pushed out, and they had relocated as refugees throughout Europe. And they brought with them not only their deep understanding and deep knowledge of their mother tongue, Greek, and its literature, but also brought with them many Greek New Testament manuscripts. So again, we see the providence of God all throughout this process. The importance of Tyndale's removal to study at Cambridge, I don't think can be overemphasized. The importance of Tyndale's removal to study at Cambridge cannot be overemphasized. Not only did he gain an even greater knowledge of Greek under Erasmus there, But he also became acquainted with Reformation teachings at that place. The German reformer, Martin Luther, you may have heard of him, had begun writing some of his earliest Reformation writings in the years 1517 to 1519. And by 1520, they had begun circulating amongst the universities throughout Europe and England. Luther's writings were popular reading at Cambridge while Tyndale was a student there. And during Tyndale's time at Cambridge... He not only greatly advances his knowledge of Greek under Erasmus, but also comes to embrace the core truths of the Reformation via the writings of Martin Luther, which were being read and discussed in Cambridge. So Cambridge is pivotal for the English Reformation because it's pivotal for the life of William Tyndale. In 1521, Tyndale decided he needed to step away from the academic atmosphere to give more careful thought to the ideas of the Reformation. He also wanted to use the time to further study and master the Greek New Testament itself. He'd made great progress in Greek, but had just now gotten his hands on a Greek New Testament, and he wanted to really understand it well. 
our next section, the birth of a reformer, that he might give himself more fully to the study of Reformation writings and the Greek New Testament. Tyndale took a job in Gloucestershire as a tutor for the children of a wealthy Sir John Walsh. He was likely also the chaplain of the family. Again, it's not just he and his wife and their kids, but there's also many servants and other people living on the premises. Tyndale also spent time doing regular itinerant preaching in the area during this time, preaching regularly in the little, ch- the little church of St. Adeline. During this time, he realized that England would never be evangelized, that is, Christianized, brought to an understanding of the gospel as the Reformation had laid it out using Latin Bibles. He came to see that, quote, it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were laid before their eyes and their mother tongue so they could read it themselves, end quote. As he traveled about the region, it became known that his beliefs were becoming distinctly Luther-like. Around 1522, he was called before John Bell, the chancellor of the diocese of Worcester, warned about his controversial views at that time. You're becoming too enamored with Luther. You better knock it off. No formal charges were made, but this incident was a foretaste of what was to come in the life of William Tyndale. Sir John Walsh, who he's living with as a tutor and chaplain, being an influential and wealthy man in the area, often had important aristocrats, businessmen, deans of universities, and church leaders over for supper. Oftentimes, while dining at the same table as Tyndale, the conversations centered around the learned men of the day, like Erasmus and Luther, as well as current controversies and questions about theology and the scriptures. Now, Tyndale, being trained not only in their schools, but most importantly, in the school of God's word, when asked his opinion about the matters while sitting at supper, would demonstrate his understanding of the topics from, from God's word as simply and as plainly as he could. Biographer John Fox tells us that when these men would disagree with Tyndale, uh, was, that was often the case, Tyndale would, quote, show unto them in the book, in the Bible, and lay plainly before them the open and manifest places of the scriptures to confute their errors and confirm his sayings. At length, these men waxed weary of Tyndale, John Fox says, and bear a secret grudge in their hearts against him. End quote. So he's shaming these men. He's just a tutor at this guy's house. He's just a chaplain in this guy's house. And he's putting to shame all these aristocrats and church leaders and deans of universities. Not long after these men began to grow tired of Tyndale, certain high-ranking men in the church invited Master Walsh and his wife to a banquet where they would be able to speak with Sir Walsh and his wife freely about their views without any refutation from Tyndale. So instead of going over to supper, we'll invite them out because Tyndale won't be there to bring up the Bible. When Sir Walsh and his wife returned, they called for Tyndale after they got back from this banquet and began to speak with him about what the priests had told them at the banquet and to reason with Tyndale whether these things were so. Now that they had the ear of the Walshes, the Walshes come back. Uh, we've heard all these things, and we didn't ever have you interrupting, so now we can really understand what they were saying. So they want to hear from Tyndale what his answer is. Tyndale answered them by the scriptures and not by church tradition, not by conjecture, and was able to maintain the truth while reproving the false teachings of these priests that they had been telling the Walshes. Mrs. Walsh, being only somewhat convinced of Tyndale's arguments, asked him, In as many words, I'm paraphrasing and summing up a long chunk here. If you are so smart, then why are you not paid what these good men, these good priests are paid? Why should we believe you over them? Why why aren't you in their position then, if you're so smart? If they're wrong and you're right, why should we believe you? Tyndale gave her no answer and ceased to talk any more on these subjects, seeing that it was to no avail. But he didn't give up altogether trying to teach the truth to the Walshes. It happened at this time that Tyndale was finishing his translation of Erasmus' book, Enchiridion Militis Christiani, which means a handbook of the Christian soldier, from Latin into English. Upon finishing it, he presented it to Sir Walsh and his wife, a handwritten copy of it. 
The master and his wife carefully read the book and the notes that Tyndale had attached to it. And afterwards, the priests and the professors were no longer invited to dinner, and they didn't go out with them to dinner anymore either. Soon after this, Tyndale made acquaintance with one of the leading university professors and higher-ups in the church, who was sympathetic to Tyndale's views. This man had come to be convinced of many of Luther's teachings and had concluded that the Pope was Antichrist. He warned Tyndale, quote, Beware of what you say, for if you shall be perceived to be of the opinion that the Pope is the Antichrist, it will cost you your life, end quote. Sometime later, Tyndale found himself in the company of some learned men and doctors of the church. Again, some of these more well-respected professors, theologians, pastors of the day. A bitter debate broke out concerning the teachings of the scriptures. And one of the most respected men of the group began to shout, We were better to be without God's laws than the Pope's laws. Tyndale had tried to remain soft-spoken up to this point, but he couldn't tolerate that level of blasphemy which was being spoken. He stood from his seat at the table and he proclaimed what became some of his most famous words. I'll let John Fox tell the whole story. Quote, Master Tyndale, hearing this, full of godly zeal and not bearing that blasphemous saying, replied and said, I defy the Pope and his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I shall cause the boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than he dost, meaning the Pope. End quote. Shortly after this confrontation, Tyndale realized it would no longer be safe for himself or for the Walsh family and their children for him to remain in Gloucestershire any longer. In 1523, he left for London, where he hoped to find some educated and sympathetic men who would be patrons for him in his work of translating the Greek New Testament into the English language, so that the common man, the common woman, the common child could read the gospel for themselves. He hoped to find such a patron in the man of Bishop Tonstall. He was sadly mistaken in this as he found that Tonstall, who had worked alongside Erasmus in producing his Greek New Testament, was actually committed to stopping the spread of Luther's teachings, Lutheran teachings, which they had seen explode in popularity after after Luther's German translation of the Bible. So, though though Erasmus and some of the other guys kind of danced around the idea of the Reformed doctrines, once they saw Luther's translation of the Bible into German being put in the hands of the people and Lutheran teaching spreading like wildfire, they decided it probably wasn't that good of an idea to translate this thing into any more languages. Tunstall's refusal to meet with Tyndale only deepened his convictions, however, to translate the Bible into English. He knew, Tyndale knew, that England desperately needed a Bible that the common man could read. However, he was not certain how to do it or where to do it. While in London, he preached numerous times, mostly at St. Dunstan's Church in West London. Well, there, a wealthy cloth merchant named Humphrey Mammoth heard him preach, and he decided to become his patron. This financial backing allowed Tyndale to remain in London for a year, long enough to develop a plan as to what to do moving forward. Now, it's important to remember this guy, Mammoth, and what he did. He was a wealthy cloth merchant. If Tyndale was to accomplish this translation project, he realized that there was, quote, no place to do it in all of England, end quote. Opposed by the English church, Tyndale acknowledged that he must leave his beloved home country, if he was ever going to complete this labor of love. In April 1524, Tyndale sailed for the continent to launch his translation and publishing work. He was doing so without the king's consent, which was a crime against the law of England. Tyndale lived in exile from England for the final 12 years of his life as a fugitive and an outlaw, and then as a heretic in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church. Our next section, in in exile. Tyndale set sail and arrived in Hamburg, Germany. 
Though there is debate amongst Tyndale scholars, it seems probable and most likely that Tyndale traveled from there to Wittenberg to study under Luther and the rest of the leading German divines, though neither Tyndale nor Luther ever mentioned this. The reason for this absence of mentioning that he studied under Luther on Tyndale's side may be due to the fragmentary nature of his writings, first of all, and his busyness did not really permit him to ever write anything by way of autobiography. From Luther's side, Tyndale was just one of thousands of students who were flocking from all over Europe to study with him in Wittenberg, and he would likely have not taken much notice at all of Tyndale. This being said, it would make perfect sense for Tyndale to seek refuge in Wittenberg, where he had master theologians such as Luther and Philip Melanchthon to learn from and to ask questions about any of the peculiarities he was seeing in the Greek New Testament, all the safety as well as having safety from the Roman Catholic Church there in Wittenberg. It is here in Wittenberg that Tyndale began the work of translating the New Testament from Greek into English. Wittenberg had just recently, under the leadership of Luther, cast off the remaining authority of the Pope, allowing her inhabitants much greater freedom than before, especially civically. This is very important. This is very important to understand the next part of Tyndale's story. Why? Well, the Jews had been expelled from England since 1279. But in this region here in Saxony and Wittenberg, and specifically, because of freedom from the papacy, there, the Jews there were numerous enough that some could be found who even were well-versed in the Hebrew tongue. Not only did Tyndale now have access here in Wittenberg to learn the language of the Old Testament, Hebrew, from Luther and the university professors there in Wittenberg, but he also had access to many rabbis and educated Jews who could instruct him in Hebrew as well. Biographer Henry Walter tells us that within three years of leaving England, Tyndale had made such progress in the Hebrew language as to, quote, be able to give considerable insight into some of the peculiarities of Hebrew, end quote. Not surprising with Tyndale. In August 1525, Tyndale traveled to Cologne, where he completed his first translation of the New Testament from Greek into English. At that time, Cologne was the most populous town in Germany. In this bustling city, Tyndale found a printer, Peter Quintel, to publish his translation. He wanted the secrecy of the printing to be guarded at all costs, as you might expect. But the news about Tyndale's publishing and printing project leaked when one of the print workers drank too much wine and spoke freely about it at a pub. A bitter opponent of the Reformation, John Cochleus, overheard and immediately arranged for a raid on the press. However, Tyndale was warned of the raid just moments before. He was able to go there and gather the leaves that had been printed. Only 10 pages had been run off so far. He was able to gather up all those leaves of the English New Testament, first ever to be printed, and he ran and escaped into the night. Leaving Catholic entrenched Cologne, he fled up the Rhine to the more Protestant-friendly city of Worms. The publication and distribution of the English New Testament. Remember, Worms was the city in which Luther had been tried for heresy in 1521, where he had uttered his now famous words, Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. By 1526, when Tyndale was living in Worms, the Reformation had taken strong roots there. In in Worms, Tyndale found a printer, Peter Schoffer, who agreed to complete the printing of his English New Testament. This was the first portion of the scriptures to be translated into English from Greek and to be mechanically printed ever in history. Roughly 6,000 copies of this first edition were printed. Over the next eight years, two revised editions followed, which we'll look at. Stephen Lawson tells us that, quote, by spring 1526, Tyndale began to smuggle his English New Testaments into England in bales of Cotton. Remember, Cotton, his first patron, was a cotton merchant. In Antwerp, English merchants shipped them to England, where German Lutheran cloth merchants received them. Once past the royal agents, these forbidden New Testaments were picked up by the Christian Brethren, a secret Protestant society, and then were taken, taken around England 
to various cities, universities, and monasteries. They were sold to eager merchants, to students, tailors, weavers, bricklayers, and peasants alike, all hungry to read God's word for themselves. Each one cost three shillings and two pence, which was a week's wage for a skilled labor. But demand quickly outstripped supply. They took off. They're a big hit. By the summer of that year, the existence of Tyndale's New Testament was made known to the church officials in England, who reiterated the fact that it was forbidden and illegal to buy, own, sell, read, handle, or even hear this book. Tyndale's New Testament was then burned. In 1527, William Warham, the Archbishop of Canterbury, designed an ingenious plan to stop the spread of Tyndale's translation. Here's what it was. He thought it would be best to purchase all of the remaining copies of Tyndale's New Testament and then destroy them. That would stop them from spreading, right? However, in the providence of God, the money from the sales actually enabled Tyndale to produce a revised second edition. Warham unintentionally financed a better, more accurate edition with a larger print run. (laughs) Moses learns English. In 1529, Tyndale moved from Marburg to Antwerp. This thriving city offered him good printing, sympathetic fellow Englishmen, and a direct supply route to England. Here he completed his translation of the first five books of Moses from Hebrew into English. But he felt the danger was too great to stay in this large city. It was still largely Roman Catholic at the time. He realized that the Pentateuch must be printed elsewhere. Tyndale then therefore boarded a ship to sail to the mouth of the Elbe River in Germany. And from there he would go to Hamburg. Sadly, a severe storm struck the ship and it was wrecked off the coast of Holland. His books, his writings, and the Pentateuch translation were all lost at sea. If, we've, if you've ever had to translate a portion of Hebrew for an assignment, uh, trans- losing the entire Pentateuch, that would be devastating. Tyndale, undertook, or, or Tyndale lost all of his efforts so far. He was forced to start the work of translating the Pentateuch from scratch. He eventually arrived in Hamburg, though, and was received into the home of the von Emersons, who was a family with strong sympathies for the Reformation. In this safe environment, Tyndale undertook the effort of retranslating the Pentateuch from the Hebrew language into English. This task took from March to December 1529. Actually, pretty quick. Offers are then made to Tyndale. That's our next section. In November 1530, Thomas Cromwell, a counselor to Henry, tried another strategy to stop Tyndale. He commissioned Stephen Vaughan, an English merchant who was sympathetic to the Reformation, to go and find Tyndale. On behalf of the king, Vaughan was instructed to offer Tyndale a salary and safe passage back to England. So we'll send a guy who's sympathetic to Tyndale's views, who agrees with Tyndale, so he's not threatening. He's just going to come over and say, hey, come back. The king wants to give you a salary and safe passage back to England. Well, when he arrived on the continent, Vaughn sent three letters to Tyndale, each addressed to a different city, Frankfurt, Hamburg, and Marburg. Tyndale Tyndale ended up replying, and a series of secret meetings then took place in Antwerp during April 1531. Tyndale told Vaughn that the only way he would return to England, the only way, was if the king permit a bare text, meaning a text that doesn't have any Lutheran notes of the Bible to be printed, translated from the Greek and the Hebrew into English for the English people. If, if the king makes that happen, I'll come back. Tyndale said that if the king would do this, he would return to England, he would never translate anything again or write anything again, and he would offer his life to the king unto death if need be. That's how committed he was to seeing the English Bible in the hands of the English church. On June 19th, Vaughn wrote back to Cromwell from Antwerp these simple words. Quote, I find him, that means Tyndale, I find him always singing one note. In other words, Tyndale would not change his tune. 
he would not stop writing books or return to England until the king had commissioned a Bible in the English language. And that was his constant note. Until the king would provide the English people a Bible in their language, Tyndale would be their provider. So Vaughn returned to England without Tyndale. Betrayal and imprisonment. In early 1534, Tyndale came to live in the home of a wealthy English merchant in Antwerp, Thomas Ponce, who, according to biographer David Danielle, was, quote, a good, shrewd friend and loyal sympathizer, end quote. Ponce took Tyndale into his protection and even provided him with a stipend. He paid his salary. In relative safety, Tyndale set about the work of completing the revision of the New Testament translation, which Danielle calls, quote, the glory of all Tyndale's life work, end quote. This second edition of the Greek, of the Greek New Testament translated into English contained some 4,000 changes and corrections from the 1526 edition. Furthermore, Tyndale placed a short prologue before each book except Acts and Revelation. He also added cross-references and marginal notes. Since the king wouldn't provide one with no marginal notes, he'll provide his own. Tyndale's Hebrew was basically now as good as his Greek, and this allowed him to work masterfully on the next part of his Old Testament translation, which was Joshua through Second Chronicles. That's as far as he made it there. Back in England, a certain man, young man named Harry Phillips, had been given a large sum of money by his father to pay a man in London. So he says, go take this money and go pay this man in London. But Phillips foolishly gambled the money away, thinking that he'd be able to use his father's money to make more money. And so he'd be able to still pay the amount and have his own. But he ends up gambling it all away. Well, an unknown official in the church, we still don't know who it was, was made aware of Philip's predicament, and he offered to repay his father's money if he would travel to the continent and find Tyndale and bring him back. In his desperation, Philip's accepted the offer. Philip's goes and he arrives in Antwerp in early summer 1535, and he began to make the necessary contacts amongst the English merchants. When he found Tyndale, he established a false friendship with William Tyndale, and he won his trust. One day, Phillips lured Tyndale into a narrow passage in Antwerp, in the city, from which he could not escape, where soldiers were waiting to arrest him. After 12 years, illegally translating the Bible into English as a banished, fugitive English citizen, Tyndale was finally captured. Tyndale was taken to the castle of Vilverd, six miles north of Brussels. There, he was imprisoned behind its imposing moat, seven huge towers, three drawbridges, and massive stone walls to keep this horrible criminal in there. Shivering in the dungeon of this castle prison, Tyndale languished for nearly a year, and a half, and half of his preparations a year and a half waiting for the preparations for his trial to be made. Yet even the time of his imprisonment was not unfruitful to Tyndale. During this time, in addition to, in addition to winning his guard and his guard's entire family to Christ, kind of like Peter and Paul, huh? he wrote another apologetic treatise defending the doctrine of justification. That's how he spent his time imprisoned. In the harsh winter of 1535, Tyndale wrote one final letter to the Marquise of Bergen, requesting, quote, a warmer cap, for I suffer greatly from the cold, a warmer coat, a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out, and my shirts are also worn out, end quote. Further, Tyndale asked something in this letter that is truly indicative of his love for God's word and his brash boldness. For God's truth, he asked for, quote, a lamp to be given in the evening. It is indeed wearisome sitting alone in the dark. Permit me also to have my Hebrew Bible, my Hebrew grammar, and my Hebrew dictionary, that I may pass my time in that study. Translating the Bible into English more. That's the thing he's in prison for. While in prison, awaiting his trial for translating the Bible out of Greek and Hebrew into English, he asks for the necessary materials to continue 
translating the Old Testament into English. In August 1536, Tyndale at last stood trial. Dr. Lawson tells us what this trial consisted of. Quote, a long list of charges was drawn up against him, and he was condemned as a heretic. We didn't get a chance to talk. His offenses included believing that justification is by faith alone, that human traditions cannot bind the conscience, that the human will is bound by sin, and that there is no purgatory, and that neither Mary nor the saints pray for Christians, and that Christians should not pray to them. That's, those were his heretical charges. Yeah, amen. After the trial, Tyndale was excommunicated from the priesthood and then was handed over to the secular powers for punishment. The death sentence was pronounced upon him. Back in his dungeon, a steady stream of priests and monks and rulers came to his cell to harass him and to call upon him to repent of his heretical views. This next section, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Tyndale was executed on October 6th, 1536. Dr. Lawson captures the pathos of the scene well, so I quote him in full. <clears throat> quote, A large crowd gathered at the southern gate of the town, held back by a barricade. In the circular space, two beams were raised in the form of a cross. At the top was a strong iron chain. Brush, straw, and logs were piled at the base of it. At the set time, a procure general, who was the emperor's attorney, sat down with the other officials. The crowd parted as the guards brought Tyndale out. Tyndale was allowed a moment to pray and then was urged one last time to recant. When he refused, the guards tied his feet to the bottom of the cross and fastened the chain around his neck. The brush, straw, and logs were packed around him and bags of gunpowder were tied around his neck. It was probably at this moment that Tyndale cried his famous last words, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Now the, the chain and the gunpowder, that's good to give an explanation for that. That was out of honor for him being a priest, so he got to have his head blown off rather than just burned to death. When the procure general gave the signal, the executioner qu quickly tightened the noose, strangling Tyndale. The procure general then handed a lighted wax torch to the executioner, lit the brush and straw. The gunpowder then exploded, blowing up Tyndale. What remained of the limply hanging burnt body then fell into the glowing fire. That's from Fox's Book of Martyrs. In this last section, ere long, and the boy who drives the plow doth know the word. Tyndale's one consuming passion was that if God so spared his life, he would translate and distribute God's word so that the simple farm boy, even, working in the fields, would know the scriptures even better than the Pope. Tyndale was able to complete two editions of his translation of the entire Greek New Testament into English, the second being a true work of literary art, 90% of which lives on in the King James Bible, but was only able to complete the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into English as far as Second Chronicles plus the prophet of Jonah. Before his life was snuffed out, but God, who is rich in mercy, had heard the prayers of Tyndale. While in Antwerp, Tyndale began a friendship with a fellow Englishman by the name of John Rogers, who had studied at Cambridge with him. He led Rogers, John Rogers, to the Lord, and he taught him Greek and Hebrew as well. Tyndale was able to do so. Tyndale did not know this, but while he was waiting to be martyred in Vilvert Prison, Rogers had picked up right where Tyndale had left off in his translation of the Hebrew Bible. He finished his finished translation was printed in between Tyndale's Pentateuch, Jonah, and the New Testament. The finished product came to be known as the Matthews Bible, which formed the major basis for the Geneva Bible, and the Bishop's Bible, and the King James Bible, on and on. Shortly after Tyndale's death, his prayer for the King of England was answered. Seeing that it was becoming useless to fight against the circulation of Tyndale's Bible, the king permitted that the Bible should be fully translated and published. There were some other things going on there too. Before the end of the year, the first ever volume of Holy Scripture to come off of an English printing press was brought forth, and that from the king's own royal printer. This volume was the Tyndale New Testament, 
with his prologues, his notes, his cross-references, and headings, with the name of William Tyndale ornately set forth on its title page. The eminent English printers, Grafton and Whitchurch, paid out of their own pocket the cost to complete the Bible which Tyndale and Rogers had begun. On the 4th of August that year, the Bible was printed and presented to the king and subsequently sent to King Henry's counselor, Cromwell, to obtain from Henry his, quote, royal license that the same, this book, this Bible, be sold and read of every person without danger of any act, proclamation, or ordinance heretofore granted to the country. In other words, that it would be legal for them to have and read it. Within this Bible, this Tyndale Bible, we find these English words. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it wheresoever he will. Proverbs 21.1 The heart of this wayward king of England, King Henry, was now turned by the Lord to sanction what he had previously denounced. Conclusion. I will close from a, with a quote from Henry Walter's biography. Quote, Tyndale had said to Vaughn, Quote, if the king would grant only a bare text of the scripture to be put forth among his people, be it the translation of what person soever he shall please, doesn't have to be mine, I will promise never to write more, nor abide two days in these parts. He was indeed to write no more, and he no longer abode on the earth, but more than he had asked had been given him by the king of kings. The scripture was licensed to be put forth, and his own translation was accepted, And his instructive prefaces were not removed, but to be more than tacitly acknowledged to contain a godly and wholesome doctrine necessary for those times. And in the words of John Fox, thus much of William Tyndale, who for his notable pains and travail may be worthily called an apostle of England. Dear congregation, from the life of William Tyndale, let us learn to see just how great of a gift we hold in our hands every time we open our English Bibles. Our Bibles have come to us at a great cost, and it's a gracious gift of God that we hold in our hands that we ought never to take for granted. There are many Christians throughout our world who are still without a Bible in their language. I met many of them in India where they had to learn other dialects or major Indian languages because in their own dialect they didn't have one. Yet we English speakers cannot even begin to number the amount of English Bible editions, translations, and resources that we have at our disposal. In William Tyndale, we have a vivid portrait of what a love for God's word looks like, a tenacious defense of the truths contained in it, an inescapable desire to see its teachings preached, taught, proclaimed and placed in the heads, hearts, and hands of all God's people, and an undying devotion to the study of the very words which God spake by holy men of old, who wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit under divine inspiration. Tyndale spared no pains or efforts to learn the languages that God spoke to his people in, not only so that he could say the scriptures for himself, but so that he could translate them for all God's people who did not have the opportunity to learn Greek and Hebrew. If this one man could master Greek and Hebrew so that we could read God's word in English, it should not seem too much for us to give ourselves to the regular and diligent study of God's word in English. It should not seem too much for us to have to give up some extra sleeping time or some fun time in order to make diligent use of God's word, because Tyndale gave his time, his comfort, his reputation, and his own life that we could read what God has to say to us, his people. Tyndale was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice because he knew the power of the Holy Scriptures. Let us earnestly seek the Lord, dear congregation, that he would give us only a portion of such knowledge, that we too might learn to relish and delight ourselves in God's word. Amen.